So hello everyone and welcome to my talk about TPM emulation with Beehive. So before I start, let me introduce myself and um, yeah, explain what I and my company is doing. So I'm Corbin Kröner, I'm a software developer at Back of Automation and um, focusing on x86 and hypervisor technologies. And uh, at Backoff, we are doing industrial automation with PC-based control. So um, yeah, we're developing all of this stuff. So we are developing industrial um, PCs, I/O terminals, drives, and also software to uh, drive all the stuff. And uh, yeah, our use case for Beehive is. So we are doing industrial automation. So we are using real-time systems and we have a real-time software called Trincat, which we normally, um, which normally is a Windows application. So we have, a, we're running Windows on our industrial PCs. And now for our small devices, um, we are started to make use of FreeBSD. And uh, yeah, but as our customers, uh, familiar with Windows. We are um, they're using Beehive to start a Windows VM. And there we run a, um, they're using GPU pass through to get a graphical user interface. <laughs> but we can also use other operating system like Linux for running Docker um, or previously, for example. So, and uh, yeah, my are we interested in TPM emulation? So first of all, the TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. And it's a um, yeah, crypto processor, which you can use to um, store your cryptographic keys. And um, yeah, with these cryptographic keys, you can authentic authenticate yourself. Um, and it can also be used to do platform measurement to make sure that um, you really boot the system uh, that you like to boot. And um, yeah, so due to these capabilities, the uh, TPM module is used by some uh, services. And in order to drive, as uh, to use these services in your virtual machine, you need, uh, yeah, the TPM. Okay, so let's start with um, a short overview. Uh, of my presentation. So I will start with a uh, short live demonstration. Um, after this live demonstration, we will take a look at other hypervisors. So how do they um, implement the TPM emulation? And at the end, I will explain um, what's currently supported by um, FreeBSD, what is the current state of um, yeah, the TPM emulation, and then there will be uh, some time for questions. Okay, so let's start with the um, live demonstration. So I've prepared a um, FreeBSD system. It's not running um, native FreeBSD. It's running our own FreeBSD fork because um, TPM emulation is not supported in upstream FreeBSD yet. And um, yeah, so I will first start booting a Linux VM because um, yes, the TPM tools aren't properly supported on FreeBSD. So we have to use a Linux VM. Okay. So yeah, we'll start with this uh, Beehive command. So we're calling Beehive, assigning some flags to create some ACPI tables and so on, assigning some CPU across the memory, some um, PCI devices as you usually do. Yes? Is it possible you can make the font a bit bigger? Um, I don't know. Um... Was it a smart? Oh. Okay. Yeah, so it's mostly like a normal Beehive command. They're only changing thing is just you have to add the new TPM device. 
And here I'm using the pass-through emulation type. So it means that I am accessing the um, yeah, real physical um, TPM device. Okay, so now our VM boots up. Well, it seems like it takes some time. Okay, there we are. Okay, so wait a moment, I will change the phone a bit. Okay, so now we are in the VM and when you check the device tree, we are now found, uh, yeah, the TPM device. So it's there. And now you can just use uh, your TPM commands as usual. So for example, um, yeah, you can use the TPM device to generate some random numbers. So if you're doing so, and if you repeat it, yeah, you get some, um, yeah, always another output. So some random numbers. And uh, let me check. Okay, and so now you can also use, for example, the TPM device to encrypt some data. So therefore you um, first of all have to create a primary key. <laughs> Well, let me check this command. It's create primary. Take an error out of memory content. Okay. Well, so I don't know why it don't work. So yeah, maybe just Let's continue with, yeah. So I already did this and um, yeah, um, captured the output. So I hope you can read it, but um, yeah, it's most importantly, if you run those commands, um, you will see you get some output. And um, yeah, so first of all, you can create your, um, uh, encryption keys and after you're done with this um, so at the end you will have a private key and a um, public key so as usual um, when using encryption and this can then be used to encrypt some data so yeah I hope you can see this but if you Yeah, you can. See. Yeah. So if you have a, a secret string, for example, and then encrypt it, you will get some um, yeah random output, and um, you can also decode it to um, get the yeah, to decode the encrypted data. And yeah, so I will continue with these slides. So um, and as a next step. We can also try to boot a Windows 11 uh, VM um, because at the moment uh, Windows 11 is not supported by Beehive um, because Windows 11 has some uh, yeah, system requirements which aren't met by Beehive yet. So if you um, would boot Beehive with um, the standard um, command, <laughs> you will um, see that Windows complains um, that your 
hardware doesn't meet the requirements. But if you change your command line with this um, new feature and add the TPM emulation, uh, you will see that Windows will uh, start the email, uh, installation and um, everything works as expected. Okay, so after this, let's take a short look at how other hypervisors implement the uh, TPM emulation. So, and I'm now uh, taking a look at the Acorn hypervisor and the QEMU hypervisor. So the Acorn hypervisor does a, yeah, you can call it real pass-through uh, when it uses TPM pass-through because um, the guest can directly access the memory of the TPM device. So there is no hypervisor interaction um, yeah, required. And yeah, so it looks like uh, similar to this um, picture at the uh, at the side. Um, yeah, so of um, yeah, of course, the advantages are that you have no hypervisor interaction, um, so we don't need any emulation. Um, in general, pass through is faster without um, hypervisor interaction, but um, yes, yeah, the TPM device isn't the fastest by intention because uh, otherwise it may, may be possible to leak some uh, secrets um, by um, side channel um, attacks. Mm -hmm. um, so speed doesn't really matter here. Um, yeah, but the disadvantages of this um, of this uh, strategy is that um, so the hypervisor has to tell the VM how the um, real TPM device uh, works. So we, it has to provide some ACPI tables to the guest, and those have to match the real hardware. And um, yeah, the problem with this is there could be different types of TPM. So the hypervisor has to identify the correct type of the TPM in order to be able to um, report this to the VM. And additionally, um, so the, the um, uh, host OS um, might also, um, could also try to access the TPM device. So you have to make sure that the host OS doesn't access the, the device while the guest is using it because you don't know what the guest is doing and uh, this could lead to collisions. Uh, and the last point is that so in um, yeah, if you're using this um, this TPM stack, it's not so easy to implement a virtual TPM. So because Mostly, you only have one TPM device in your system, and if you're using a pass-through, you can just use pass it to a single VM. And um, yeah, if you have multiple VMs which with which want to use TPM services, um, yes, it wouldn't be so easy with this um, TPM stack. So you have to implement another emulation. So on the other side, the QEMU hypervisor. Um, it does an emulation, so it intercepts the memory access of the TPM device and uh, then sends this TPM request to the um, yeah, um, device of the host um, operating system, which is responsible to access the real TPM device. Um, so yeah, if you like um, you can say, yeah, that's not real pass-through, that's true, but um, I still call it pass-through because we are accessing the real TPM device. And um, the advantage, advantages of this um, solution is that you can um, yeah, say, that is the TPM interface I'm exposing to the guest, and you don't have to, um, to emulate or handle multiple different um, interfaces because all that's done by the kernel module of the host operating system. And 
Yeah, and due to the file access to the host um, PPM device, there can't be conflict that the host tries to access this, the uh, TPM device while the guest access it. And the last point is it's fairly easy to implement a virtual TPM. So it's mostly um, called software TPM. And uh, because it's just file IO for the uh, hypervisor to um, send and receive TPM commands. So you can just exchange this with the uh, software TPM device. And um, yeah, that's all you have to do. And um, is it the advantage of the software TPM device is also that you can uh, use migration and snapshotting because on hardware TPM devices, it's not possible to um, migrate the TPM state um, because otherwise you can leak some uh, private data. Okay, and uh, yeah, the disadvantages in um, that you have hypervisor interactions. Okay, so to summarize it and uh, yeah, and to answer the question which uh, approach we should use. So on the pro side for Akron is that we ha don't have any hypervisor interaction. Um, yeah, but I don't think that this is a real big pro. Um, and on the QEMO side, um, we have the advantage that it's easier to implement because we um, can, we have much extraction abstraction due to the um, host kernel driver. And uh, it's also very easy to implement the virtual TPM device. So my sug suggestion would be to um, use QEMU's approach. And that is what we, so what I already did in our FreeBSD fork. And um, as a current status um, that we're actually supporting TPM, um, TPM version 2.0 and yeah, that's the most recent TPM version. And um, it's also the TPM version required by most tools and um, for example, Windows 11. Mm -hmm. And on the emulation, we are only supporting pass-through at the moment um, and not a virtual TPM. Um, I think the biggest issue is to um, add support for this um, software TPM would be the software TPM itself because I haven't tested it yet and I'm not sure if so it's a um, yeah, Git repository which implements the software TPM and I'm not sure if it runs under FreeBSD. Um, yeah, but if this runs under FreeBSD, it should be very easy to um, yeah, ch and make, make some changes to Beehive to support this device as well. Is the license compatible? Uh, I don't know. I haven't checked the license. Okay. And uh, yeah, if you're looking at the operating systems which are supported, so currently we support all, yeah, I say three major operating systems so Linux, FreeBSD, Windows. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, here I mentioned some um, common services. So on, uh, under Linux and FreeBSD, you usually use the TPM2 tools. And um, yeah, there's also the Azure IoT Edge, which uses the TPM, which works. <coughs> um, one thing which doesn't work is BitLocker. I don't know why yet. Um, it complains that there are incompatibilities with the um, BIOS, but I'm, yeah, I'm not sure why. Okay. Um, yeah, but as I said in the beginning, on upstream FreeBSD, most of the stuff is not working. So I made a short list, which is required on upstream FreeBSD to um, support the um, TPM emulation. So we have to do some ACPI stuff um, because TPM devices um, yeah, require um, some additional ACPI tables. This is already merged in FreeBSD. Um, yeah, but there's missing some firmware support. So 
Currently, the firmware doesn't uh, load the ACPI tables, which are provided by Beehive. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, on the um, the last point to in, um, to merge the TPM emulation, there I've opened a review for the TPM pass through uh, emulation. And uh, yeah, but to be honest. It's outdated because, first of all, I started with this Adrian approach uh, because it seems yeah, easy and um, uh, to implement. But after using it a, a bit, I've noticed well that it doesn't really, um, yeah, it's, it has its disadvantages due to um, missing abstraction layers. And uh, so I have to update this um, patch, but I'm going to do this um, yeah, in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah, software TPM is, isn't supported by all our forks, so it can't be supported in upstream. And uh, the female support here is also missing. Okay, so that's it. Thanks for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, Feel free to ask them. Yes? Could the TPM module provide entropy to a booting VM? Sure. You showed like generating some cryptographic noise. Could yeah. that be used to generate entropy for a booting VM? So it immediately starts life with some meaningful entropy for other cryptography operations. Yeah, so the question is if you can use the TPM device to create some entropy. And uh, yeah, of course it can. So it just depends on the operating system if it makes use of this uh, feature from the TPM or not. Yes? In your research, have you come across an open source hardware discrete TPM? As background, I'm trusting by nature and seems like Making sure there's options is a really good thing. Um, no, I haven't. So, uh, for my yeah, for my testings, I'm using the firmware TPM device of our um, industrial PCs. Right, which is either or is implemented by the processor that you're not allowed to play with that's in there. Yeah, as I told so. Firmware TPM is the TPM which is uh, implemented in the processor because and on, on our industrial PCs, they are normally uh, closed systems, so you don't have... Huh? They're Intel-based, right? Yeah, they're Intel-based. There's, there's, there's an extra CPU in your CPU for the management engine. You don't get to play with it, and that's where the TPM is. Yeah. So and that's the type of TPM I've tested. Is the is the interface to the TPM simply a serial or is it more complicated than that? Like the pre TPMs on a board is going into a little header. I would sort of wonder that it was just a serial interface. So the TPM uses it's called a command response buffer interface. So it has a yeah, just a buffer where you can write a comment in. Then the TPM will process this uh, command, and at the end it will write the result. And uh, to this uh, buffer, but at the hardware at the hardware level, is it uh, is it a it's, serial bus? So it's memory mapped I/O. Oh. And on yeah, on the hardware level, I don't know how they implement this. Which of the TPM start methods are you testing with? Start method. Methods. There's a matrix of TPM versions, and you mentioned CRV, the command response buffer, or whatever. But then there's also TIS, which I think that might have been required in version one. But then there's also yes. different start methods to initialize the hardware. Yes. Yeah, so um, when you're using uh, the TPM pass through, um, the TPM is already um, initialized by the host firmware. And um, that's also one thing you have to keep in mind when you're um, 
developing this stuff. So the guest firmware uh, can't initialize the um, TPM device a second time. Right. So um, it you have to keep sure that it doesn't um, tries to do it, or that it doesn't. Um, um, so that it, that the guest firmware doesn't fail if the startup command fails. Um, but that's already so. On Beehive, we're using the OVMF, and um, there's a QEMU implementation of this OVMF and a Beehive implementation. And what I did is that I copied, uh, so I'm using the driver which QEMU uses and uh, added them to the Beehive version, and they already do all the stuff. So, um, yeah, the VM doesn't have to do anything with this startup. When you're using the software TPM device, you have to um, initialize the VM. But um, the hypervisor itself just have to um, redirect the, um, the commands from the guest to the um, host. So yes. if you can see here, the guest writes something into the yeah, memory, so in the MMIO register, and the hypervisor just passes it uh, to the host um, TPM device. So on the hypervisor side, you don't have to do anything to uh, start up the TPM device. Yeah, that, I mean, my familiarity is only out of anger. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I know there's firmware, firmware level initialization in the operating system. Thing. If you put the TPM in a bad state, uh, there's only certain ways to recover. And so like, I'm curious what a guest could do with the with the pass through approach and putting the TPM in some sort of bad state that the host. Yeah, it's it's yes. So the really hard to detect what state it's in. Yeah. <laughs> My experience, and if it's in a bad state, it can block certain power lifecycle things. Like if you're trying to suspend or mm. like that. Yeah. So if it's in a really bad state, you may have to reboot the complete host system and then uh, reset it um, yeah, in your host BIOS. Um, there's, it's called physical presence interface, which is implemented in the OVMF for the TPM device. And I haven't tested it yet and I'm not sure if it really works in Beehive, but um, yeah, it exists, and it, maybe it can be used to reboot the gas. And on the next gas reboot, that the TPM will be, for example, cleared to get a new owner. Um, yeah, but I think it doesn't work on Beehive because the problem is when you restart a Beehive VM, some VM state gets lost by um, Beehive because the Beehive process exits. And then you have to um, restart the Beehive process. So this physical presence interface doesn't work because you have to set some bits which are preserved on reboot. And this doesn't work if the Beehive process exits and loses its state. Yes? Is the TPM writable? I mean, that's the... What do you mean it was writable? Do you, do you write it? keys to it, do you write anything to it or do you just read it from it? Um, it has no, it's, yeah. It's got some persistence and that's saved in the chip. Yeah. Yeah. There's certain things that should persist through different power life cycle. So was that ever meant to be multi-tenant? So two Windows 11 virtual machines might be competing with the TPM? Yeah, so if you're using these pass-through uh, approach, you can only use uh, the TPM device for one VM. Yeah, it's it's like a PCI pass-through. So if you have a PCI pass-through, you can also use this device only for one VM. And you can, um, if you pass it to the VM, it's unusable for the host too. Hmm. Yeah. 
and that's where this uh, software TPM device comes into um, play um, because it's just an emulated TPM device and you can just spin up multiple of these uh, TPMs. Otherwise, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it seems to me, especially the first time I heard of the TPM, that it's just an admission that we've shanked OS security. And so, yeah, let's put an extra computer in here that you don't control. Because, yeah, we shank security for a user, and users don't do security either. Sorry, I'm a little bit cynical. <laughs> Okay, so any other questions? Let's make it into 14. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so because as I mentioned, I have to update my patch and uh, yeah, the schedule for um, 14 is already too late. <laughs> so <laughs> we're just waiting for the kickoff of uh, 14 right now. In your demo, when you created the primary key, it would be that the primary key would be created inside the TPM and stored inside the TPM, right? Is it maybe full after your test? How many keys can you hold there? Um, no, so this primary. With this I'm, command, was it? Yeah, yeah. Is it just, does it just use the entropy of the of the TPM, or does it store the key? In the, in mm, no. So in the TPM device, there's a, yeah, a private key which doesn't leave this TPM device. And I think if you're, yeah, you're creating this primary context, you're using this key to create. Yeah. This, so you just this, this, yes, and. Because, yeah, I'm not sure if you can see this. Um, Isn't the point of the TPM is that there's only really one key in there? It's not really about your safety. It's about the safety of the content that you might want to download. I don't know. I don't know much about TPMs, but um, what I understand is that it's a safe store for my keys or for multiple keys. Like in a UB key, you can store multiple keys. Um, I expect the same from, I would expect the same from a TPM. And just sawing this uh, error message that memory is full, maybe uh, it was just yeah. an idea, I don't know. Yeah, so, so you have some state uh, of the TPM, um, which you have to yes, save and write back. Um, if you're using the TPM on multiple uh, multiple applications, um, yeah. But um, so I think that this key is saved in the yeah in the file. So because if you um, call subsequent commands, you always have to specify which primary context you want to use, and um, so it's not saved. In the TPM, uh, but in your file. So it's like creating new SSH keys. So you have a private key, and so you're using the private key of the TPM device to create some keys. But at the end, you have a own private key and public key as file, which you can use, um, yeah, for your encryption and SSH accesses. The uh, the software emulation you found, does it do it entirely in software, or do you see it brokering commands to the host side? But I could see how if you you, you could have a kind of a proxy, yeah, so to leverage the actual hardware, I guess. Mm -hmm. There's so, certain things that I think you should be able to do faster with. So. To be honest, I didn't really look at these uh, software TPM. So if you read the QEMU docs, you read that this um, yeah, device exists, that you can use it. 
and I've also seen that there's a repository, but I haven't looked deeper into it and checked if it runs, yeah, for example, if it runs on FreeBSD or which uh, resources it uses. In general, your main processor should be way faster than your TPM. Yes. TPM is like, you know, a Raspberry Pi style processor plugged into the board, or it's your management processor, which again, is not the power of your main processor. Yeah, yeah, as I said, I so I heard that sometimes it's um, by intention that the TPM isn't so fast because, yeah, otherwise you may pull it. I mean, that that would just come down to it. You'd have, you'd have to have a cooling solution for that part of your motherboard. I think what he's saying is that they throttle the, they throttle it deliberately so that the slow yeah. down brute forcing on signatures and hashing and things like that. So because sometimes you can uh, just measure the time it takes for the TPM to respond to, um, yeah, to unhide some uh, secret. And to avoid this, the TPM, I'm, I don't know if it has a fixed response time, but uh, yes, sometimes it, um, it slows down by intention um, to avoid that someone can check the response time to, yeah, to, to Unhide your keys. Uh, I think the spec gives it a pretty big window to respond to certain events. Something quite ridiculous. The thing sucks. I mean, if we could just delete the TPM, <laughs> all our lives would be easier. Okay, so if nobody has some additional questions. Okay. <laughs> I would say that's it. Thank you.